Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you. We, we give you all the praise and glory. We thank you, Lord, for another beautiful day. Lord, we, uh, we pray for those in our class who, who are not able to make it this morning. We pray for those who <clears throat> are dealing with losses. We pray for Rachel Starks and the loss of her, her brother, Ronald. Lord, uh, we pray for uh, Augie and Beverly. Uh, Augie's still trying to get better. Lord, uh, we pray for Janet Cross's son. Uh, we lift up so many folks in this class, and uh, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to just come together and study your word. Thank you so much for an awesome church that loves the word and teaches the word. So we pray for it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. So we're going to be talking about fruits of repentance. And uh, um, we're going to be talking about John the Baptist. So, so make sure you recognize the difference between John the Baptist and John the Apostle. So uh, uh, sometimes it's, you know, no matter how long you've been in the Bible, Sometimes you, you can get a little bit confused with names because there's lots of names in the Bible that are the same. And so you just, uh, but we're talking about John the Baptist this time, also known as the forerunner of Christ. So it was prophesied that he would come. So, so hopefully today we'll see the whys and the hows of repentance and why the fruit of repentance is necessary in the lives of us believers. And it's important for us to, to know that. So understanding, what we want to do is understand the true meaning of repentance while recognizing the necessity of, of a change in our behavior after repentance. So if once one gets saved... And there's no change, there's, something's wrong. Something's wrong. And so we have to figure out, like, what is wrong? And it could be the environment that that, that person is in, that there's no uh, element of growth. You know, could it be that the person never got saved? You know, that's a possibility. Um, because a lot of times people so-called get saved out of fear. Because certain people preach the gospel and and they 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 call it fire insurance so they they try to get you to to be scared about going to hell and so you quickly say yeah I want to get saved and you never really made a a clear personal application a personal decision to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior you did it out of fear that's not to say that you won't you weren't saved, you probably were, but, but your attitude toward it is going to be different because you're always having that element of fear. And probably the, the more you grow and get older, every time you heard somebody talk about salvation, you're questioning yourself. You're saying, did I really get saved? Am I, am I saved? You're questioning it because you never really surrendered totally. So... You know, if that's you, you know, no matter how old you are, it doesn't matter to wherever you're sitting or when you go home, you, you get right with the Lord and say, hey, Lord, I, I think I need to make, make sure this is right. And I, I want to I do this. And you ask him to come into your heart. You're just reaffirming. I know I was, you know, uh, seven years old. My dad was a preacher. I didn't learn the Bible from my dad. He was a hard worker. So, but I was in church all the time. And so when I went to California at age 18, the pastor, Dr. S.M. Lockridge, who's my father in the Lord, he, he said, hey, are you saved? Yeah. Yeah, I got saved when I was seven years old. Well, do they have a record of you getting baptized and all that? Yeah, they have it at the church. Well, when they check with the church, the church said, oh, we're sorry. We remember that, but all the records were burned up in a fire. So 
And I thought, that's kind of scary, you know. <laughs> you know, so uh, he said, well, I'll tell you what. Let's reaffirm your salvation. So he took me back through it, and then I got baptized again because he wanted to reaffirm that so that I could really, as an 18-year-old, could really know for sure. And that's not to take away from 5-year-olds and 7-year-olds who get saved because they really have a great relationship with the Lord. And so, uh, so anyway, he reaffirmed mine. So I'm saying to you, when we talk about the fruits of repentance, you know, um, make sure you understand that you are going to produce those fruits as you uh, solidify your relationship with the Lord in terms of where you're at. So it's your behavior that's supposed to change after your repentance. And so, and then finally we want to look at applying repentance to salvation to be motivated to share that truth of repentance to others. So we, can, we don't want to keep it to ourselves. We want to share it with others. And so it's, it's, it's one thing to say, I got mine, you go get yours. You know, you, you should want to be able to share um, salvation with, with the uttermost to people. So we're looking at Matthew 3. It's on your handout there, Matthew 3, 1 to 12. It says, And in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare thee the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's found in Isaiah 40, verse 3. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said unto, him, to, unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat, that's worthy, for repentance. Stop right there. Let's stop right there. Because Charles Stanley said this, and he, he passed away recently. He said, uh, genuine repentance leads not only to a change in attitude, but also a change in behavior. Uh, merely feeling sorry for wrong action does not constitute repentance. So a lot of times people, you know, they're sorry because they got caught, you know, so much. He say, Charles Stanley saying, merely feeling sorry for wrong action does not constitute repentance. And then verse 9 says, And think not to say with yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of all of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So you need to understand that Repentance is not inherited. So it's not a family thing. It is individual and personal. So you didn't get in because your mother got in or your father got in. You know, you, I saw that a lot as a kid where parents would go down to the altar and they take all the kids with them. And so most of the time when the deacons or whoever were down there, they would talk to them and they would welcome them to the church. So sometimes salvation was not even talked about. They just joined the church. So then of all the funerals, a lot of the funerals that I've done, when I read the obituary, they said they accepted Jesus at a young age. And that's all they said. You know, sometimes they said they joined church at a young age. Well, that's not salvation. And so... <clears throat> So we have to say that repentance is not, in, you did not inherit that. That's a personal decision that you have to make yourself. And, and when I was at Temple Heights over there next to Baptist Temple, when I had a Bible study over there in my business, I led people to the Lord who were in their 80s and 90s. You know, because they recognized that they joined the church as young kids. And they never really had a relationship with the Lord. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying to anybody in here, maybe if, if you don't know the Lord, get right with him. 
Make sure that your repentance is individual and personal, not inherited. Then the scripture continues, it said, And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth, for, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me, he's talking about Jesus, is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the shaft with the unquenchable fire. So he's talking about Jesus who's coming after him because John the Baptist was a forerunner of Christ. Galatians 5, to 24 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So John the Baptist was preaching for people to bring forth fruits of repentance, changes in their lives based on their professed changes in their heart. So if you have a heart change, your life's going to change. You know, and, and all through the Bible, it talks about the types of hearts that we can have. You know, it's, it's, sometimes people can have a hard heart, a wicked heart, all those different things. So you want to have a heart change, and if you can do that, then you can have a, a, a change in your life. So the four passages on your handout there, Malachi 3.1, John 1.6, Matthew 11.11, and Luke 1.80, they all point out the life and ministry of John the Baptist. And so that was centuries before the birth of Christ, that it was promised that a prophet would come and prepare the way for the message of Christ. So long before Christ came, it was prophesied that John would come, a prophet would come. So your first, first fill in, John was a unique man with a unique message. A unique message. So there are, there are many preachers, you know, today who, won't, who will not preach a straightforward message like John preached. You know, he, he called those Pharisees and Sadducees vipers. He called it like it was. And and praise the Lord, we have a, a pastor who will say what's on his heart and he will preach the word the way it is and he will call it like it is. But there are a lot of preachers that will water down the gospel and to, to make it conducive to build up the congregation. And so they, they, they bring the world into the church and start doing worldly things just to have a bunch of people. And so... I'm not criticizing those churches per se, but I think when you start doing a lot of gimmicks and all the different things just to draw people in and the word of God is not being preached and taught, there's, there's a problem with that because now people are getting entertained. And when you start getting entertained, you're losing out on the message of Christ. Losing out. <clears throat> so letter A said <clears throat> it was a preach message. It was a preach message. Second Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So, um, we want to have godly sorrow. We don't want to be sorry because we got caught. And so, and I'll say it again, repentance is not being sorry that we got caught in the act of sin or an attempt to make our lives appear good for God. We, are, we can try that. But it's the interchange of mind towards oneself, toward God and towards others that's important. That interchange. Um, it is biblical repentance that leads us to salvation. It, it, what it does, it, it brings us to, to believe that and agree with God that it's sin. And sometimes we can, we can convince ourselves that what we did was not sin. Well, it really wasn't that bad. You know, it's, it was okay. I, it really wasn't a sin. 
It was just a gray area, put it that way. It was just a gray area. And so sometimes people do that. But when we figure out that it is sin, and we recognize it, I think it's better off if you, if you go ahead and call it a sin instead of thinking that it may not be, just call it a sin. And then grieve it. And, uh, and, let, and let the Lord know that, hey, I want to I want to turn away from that and surrender. I want my spirit to be in line with you. So, secondly, letter B, it was a prophesied message. A prophesied message. Since it was foretold by God back in the Old Testament before John was born, I can say that technically he was an Old Testament prophet. So, John was the last prophet to challenge people to change their hearts toward the coming Messiah. The Jews would not accept him as the Messiah. And they, they paid for that for a long time because they continued not to accept him. Matthew 17, 10 to 13 shows that the disciples were familiar with the prophecies talking about John being the forerunner of Christ. They didn't understand that. They didn't understand it at first. Verse 10 says, and I think that's on your handout, and his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you, that Elias has come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. So he's, Jesus was letting them know that it was John the Baptist who was going to be preaching the gospel of repentance. And then you see in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, that's where Paul, who was Saul at the time, uh, he, he, he approved the stoning of Stephen. Uh, Saul, who was later became Paul, was, he was a bad guy. And he caused a lot of people to die, to suffer, and all that. Uh, but Acts 7, 51 and 52, it's, it's on your handout. Uh, but like their fathers rejected Christ because they did not want to know who he was. Not because they couldn't know. They could know, but they just did not want to know. And so you and I have the word of God. And we have no excuse not to repent of our sins. And if you're not saved, you have no excuse. You, you, not, you need to do that. But these, those folks, the, 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 the Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, they, knew who, they knew who he was. They just refused to accept him. They refused to accept him. So when your mind is blinded and you can't see the truth, then you, you could be confused. And so sometimes when you're witnessing to people and it seems like that they are just putting you off. They're not putting you off. They've been blinded by something. And sometimes it's the God of this world. He blinds them, and they can't understand it. And they need you to help them take those blinders off so that they can understand that they need a Savior. So that's why it's important for you to be patient with people. Because you got yours, and maybe it was easy when you got saved. But for other people who are struggling with drugs and alcohol, abuse, they, all of those different things, those, those play into how hard it is for them to just say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll accept Jesus. Because it's, it's too easy, it sounds like. Because they're saying, oh, if, if I accept Jesus, will I stop using drugs? Will I stop being an alcoholic? Will, I, will this happen? Will my husband stop hurting me? Will my wife do what she needs to do when I get saved? Well, it doesn't happen that way. It's work. So you need to help them, you know, and be patient with them, whether they're in your family, whether you're friends or your coworkers, and all of that. And so John was patient, but he let them know where they were. So number two is a unique mission. A unique mission. There was no other man in the history of the Bible who received the mission that John the Baptist received. I mean, he was the man that was going to come before Christ. And that was, that was a mission, a really great mission. 
And one of the things is, letter A, he was a common man. He was a common man. No fancy suits, no robes, none of that. And I, I kind of chuckle when I see that today, how people put all that stuff on, you know, to, to bring the message. And you don't have to do all that to bring the message. But if that's tradition, in some churches it's tradition. And I'm not going to criticize, I'm just saying... If you're going to do that, if you're going to put on the robes and the fancy suits and all that, then make sure that you're preaching the Word of God. Make sure you're bringing it. But if you're just, if you're just up there and you're drawing attention to self, then you're not bringing the Word of God. So, John was a man, <clears throat> Matthew 11:18 says, But what, ye, what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment, behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. They're just saying that John just had on regular clothes. There was nothing fancy about him. There was nothing hip or cool about John the Baptist. I mean, he, he spent time in the desert. So like John, we must hum be humble if sharing the gospel. John 1, 22, 23 says, Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So John was just saying, hey, I'm just a prophet. And, you know, and I think if you look at it from that perspective and say, you're not all that in a bag of chips either. I'm not. You know, I just want to say, look, if you want to have a relationship with the Lord, this is what the Bible says. I'm not, I don't want to stand in front of you to make you think that I'm better than you. And sometimes that happens. If, if we get our salvation and we have the attitude, well, you need to get what I got. You know, that's, that ain't good. That's not good. So, so the idea is, is like, I, I'm a sinner saved by grace. So I'm no better than you. You know, and Rosie and I have a healthy discussion about judging. And I always talk about judging with righteousness. And so I was talking to my, well, my barber, don't have much. <laughs> we were talking about that. And, uh, and I told him, I said, when I judge with righteousness, I said, I have a, I have a set of twins who are my nieces. One of them is gay, and one of them is not. And if I see them, I tell them both. I say, hey, I love you guys. But the one who's gay, I say, look, I love you, but I do not condone your lifestyle. I'm being honest with her. I didn't say, I'm better than you. You see, you're gay, and I'm not. I'm, not, I'm way better than you. You see, that's, a, that's judging right there. But judging with righteousness is letting them know that, hey, your lifestyle is not what God likes. You see? And so that's what we have to do. We have to be careful about pointing the fingers at people and making them feel like that they're less than you are or less than I am. We have to, make, we have to be patient with them and, say, and let them know, like, hey, I love you, but I just can't condone what you're doing. And so I, I have a number of nieces and nephews in my family who who been on that end on drugs and stuff like that. And every time I saw them, I just, I loved on them, but I was not going to condone, and I was not going to support their habit. Uncle David, I just want to, I need 20 bucks, I need to get some gas. Are you sure you need gas? Uh, let's go look at your car and see what, how much gas is in your tank. The 20 bucks was not for gas. The 20 bucks was for drugs or alcohol. And I said, if you're hungry, let me go, let's go get something to eat. You know, that's what you have to do. You don't enable people. Don't enable them. You know, but love on them and care about them. Let it be, John had a compelling message. He had a compelling message. He was so compelling that people went out to John. In Matthew 3, 6, it says, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So his message was compelling. 
John knew that his message was to be about Jesus and not about him. Um, too many preachers today have made the pulpit about them and people follow the man. And that's the problem. When you start following the man, then you're not following God. Because many of them don't proclaim the true and living Christ. And it becomes a situation where if you're not careful, um, you say, oh, I, I just love this guy. I just love that guy. These guys are on television. And then you have to ask yourself, why do you love that person? And if you cannot explain what they teach, if you can't say some of the things that they are saying, what thus says the Lord, then you're not following the word of God. You're following that man or that woman in some cases because they're women on TV, you know. So here it is. Number three, it was a unique mandate, a unique mandate. So the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had their own list of rules connected to Old Testament law. And uh, so they decided to approach John where he was baptizing because they wanted to, to challenge him. And so they wanted to make a, a statement. They didn't go there to repent. That was not their, their uh, idea. And they certainly didn't want people to follow John's preaching at all. So you need to know that there's always going to be a group of people, there's always going to be Satan who wants to stop you from sharing the gospel. The gospel. If you are making Bibles, Carl was showing me the Bible that they're going to send down to Josh, Josh Keats' group in Mississippi, and that they print the word. And so it's to get the word of God out to people as well as that one has some discipleship lessons in it too, which was pretty cool. And, you know, the, the idea is like, Satan does not want you to do that. He does not want you to share the gospel with other people. So he's going to do everything he can to pull you down, slow you down. And, and sometimes we have to, it's, sometimes it's our own flesh. We give the devil more credit than he deserves. It's our own flesh that does that, you know because we're not focusing on being close enough to the Lord as we should be. So the devil, he just doesn't want you to share the gospel. So there are people who are in cults and false doctrinal churches that will try to lure you into believing what they believe all the time. And, uh, but John was not intimidated by these religious leaders. And so you shouldn't be intimidated by these naysayers, you know, Jehovah Witness and people like that will come to your door. And I noticed that they're not hitting the doors as much as they used to. I wonder why. <laughs> but they used to hit the doors like crazy. I mean, you could just see them going down the street and hitting the doors. But um, I don't know if COVID did it, but I don't know. But they don't seem to be out there as much as they were. Uh, so I was reading real quickly. I was. I'm writing a message for Father's Day for Midtown, and I'm going to talk about a guy named Jonadab. And Jonadab was, uh, he was, he was a part of killing off the rest of those false prophets of Baal back when Elijah killed out the, the 400 of Ahab's prophet, false prophets. And, uh, you know, as I was researching him, I found out that the Jehovah Witness have a group that they call the Jonadabs. And I go, oh man, I don't want to. <laughs> what is this? So the Jonadabs, the Jonadabs and the Jehovah Witness sect is a group of people who are supposedly going to live on the earth forever. Because God told Jeremiah that this family of the Rechabites will stand before him forever. So the Jehovah Witness have taken that and said, oh, we're going to have a whole class of Jonadabs. <clears throat> but the catch to it was, you can't be a Jonadab until somebody in the Naomi circle drops off. So it's like, oh, so we can't even get in. Because, you know, they already say they're the 144,000. They already say that. So I'm saying, how do they count? When their Jehovah Witnesses born every day, people who join the, that every day, when did the count stop? Where is the 140? Where did they come from? 
the Bible clearly says it's not Jehovah Witness. But this Jonadabs is another group of people that, that they said, you know, like, hey, you're going to live forever on this earth. But the catch to it is you can't be one until this person drops off the list. I, I don't see, when you get into, into those type of cults and things like that, God's grace is free. Unmerited, you know, unconditional. And once you accept him, you're in. You don't have to worry about getting kicked off the list. You, know, name getting, you did something wrong, get pulled off the list. You're in. And that, that makes it hard for people who don't want to accept salvation the way it is. But it, but it is. And so, but, but John was letting them know he was not intimidated by them. And so, um, he called them an old generation of vipers. He didn't say he was better than them. He was just letting them know that their spirituality was external and legalistic. And on top of that, the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees, they didn't even believe in the resurrection of Christ. They didn't believe in it. So, letter A, John was concerned for truth. He was concerned for truth. He might have come across a little strong, but he told the truth. And since today, sometimes... Um, we are told to be more tolerant and believe that all religions are the same. All religions are not the same. They're not the same. And so you have to believe the Word of God. You have the written Word of God in that King James Bible. And, and unfortunately, you know, the, the world, the devil, is, wants to change God's Word and make it more simple. But in the process, take out key words and key scriptures that is important for our growth. And so, so if, you are, if you have family members or friends who are a part of these cults, these different groups, um, just be patient with them. Pray for them. But don't trust them when they deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So 1 John 4, 3 says, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it shall come, and even now already is it in the world. So that, the spirit of Antichrist is, is, is there. Uh, we're, we're in the Laodicea in church age, and so the Bible says you're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. You know, and if you need to get on fire for the Lord or not. But if you want to straddle the fence, be right there in the middle, because you don't want to offend anybody, that's not good either. But tell the truth like it is. You know, be honest. Even with family, you know, sometimes you have to tell them the truth. And they need to hear the truth. If it's your brother, your sister, your kids, your grandkids, nieces and nephews, your husband or your wife, you know, you just, you need to tell the truth. Let it be said, he, was, he corrected their thoughts. He corrected their thoughts. John recognized that the religious leaders needed the truth. And they were blinded by tradition. Tradition. And I, I, I grew up in, in a black Baptist church, and so much was, was tradition in the churches that I grew up in. Then I went to Baptist Temple, which was totally different, predominantly white church. But unfortunately, there was a lot of tradition there too. So I'm not going to be one to criticize what church has more tradition or whatever because, of, because of, there's tradition in, in a lot of churches. And so sometimes tradition is where you're sitting in your chair. You ever, you ever thought about that? It's like certain people get to church early enough to get their seat. And if you got there early before they did, and you were sitting in their seat, they would just kind of stand and, and just wait. <laughs> just to let you know, like, that so true. that's my seat. Yeah. Tradition. I mean, it's like, that's, I sit there every Sunday. And you should not be sitting there. And then there's certain things that tradition does in churches that you say, well, we just don't do that. So they try different things, and some of the older members don't like the idea of change. And so 
you, you have to say, how do, we, how do we get to a point of, of pleasing all people? You won't. You just won't. And so John did not want to please these people, these religious leaders. He just told them the truth. And he corrected their thoughts. So um, there are so many people around the world who place their eternal security on religion. So they count rosary beads. You know that if you have a Catholic background. Uh, what they give to the poor. Uh, uh, Rosie and I was in a play that she directed back in the old days about the Wardolph Astoria. I don't know if any of you guys remember that place. Well, we, we did a play there, and she was a director, and she was also the part of the play. I was a judge, Judge G.O. Davis, God. And, uh, and she had to come before my court because she was falsely accused of not witnessing. And so, um, and so, so the, the prosecuting attorney ripped her up really bad and told her her name was Lou Ida, Lou Ida something. And so, so the prosecutor said, yeah, your name is Luada Smith Jones something, something, something. And so she started bragging to the court about what she did on Sunday. She said, I give 25 cents in Sunday school each and every Sunday. And she was just bragging about what she did. And the prosecutor lady just ripped her apart, you know, because it was tradition that it's a habit. You're going to put this money in, and you do that, and it really doesn't amount to anything because you wanted people to know what you did. You see, when you do things for the world to see it, then it's a traditional thing that you're doing that has nothing to do with your relationship with the Lord at all. And so Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So it's not enough, as I draw to a close, it's not enough to be born into a religious family or try to embrace a religious heritage. You receive Christ by faith. Um, John 1, 12, 13, but as many as received him to give to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they did not have a relationship with Jesus. What they had was an empty religion with a fruitless life. That's what they had. And John warned them that if they didn't exercise true repentance and prove it with fruit to show, they would be like a tree cut down that produced no fruit. That's what he was saying to them. And finally, let us see, he challenged them to turn. He challenged them to turn. He challenged those religious leaders to repent of their sin. And it was not easy for them to admit that their need for a Savior. Be the reason why, because they didn't want to accept Jesus as the Messiah in the first place. So why would you accept him if you don't believe it was him? And so they were very self-sufficient and content in their own righteousness. But John reminded them that a judgment day was coming and that they better repent of their sins before it's too late. So the fruit of repentance that John preached had nothing to do with earning God's forgiveness. It was a challenge to agree with God that they could do nothing to earn his favor. They couldn't do anything. They just needed to accept him and to prove their trust in Christ by shedding those outward works of this dead religion that they were practicing because that's what they were doing, the law. They were practicing the law. And finally, Acts 26, 20 says, But show first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So John's ministry, his entire ministry, was wrapped up in preparing people for the coming of the Lord. So when you and I put our trust in Christ, the fruits of repentance will be abound in our lives. Uh, there will be a change in heart, which will show a change in behavior. If you're already saved, how frequently do you repent? If you go days and weeks without recognizing sin in your life, 
and asking God for forgiveness and cleansing, you're missing out on an essential part of your Christian life. 1 John 8, 1, 8 and 9, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our, uh, our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins for to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, if we agree with God regarding our sin and turn to him for forgiveness, we are preparing our hearts for the coming of the Lord. That's what we're doing. And so um, I, I pray that, that the message this morning was enlightening to a point where I was not trying to make you feel like you're not saved. I'm just saying, if you're not saved, get saved. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with getting saved at an older age at all. So before I close out with prayer, so I got 30 seconds. So um, Ed Hell, uh, I have a friend who has a company called Patriot Features. And so I was able to convince him to do a film on Ed. And uh, so I will send it out through the class email. It's an awesome film on his life, uh, on his, because Patriot Features, Patriot Features is about the military guys who served in all the different wars, and they really focus on a lot of the older uh, veterans. And some of these veterans are 90, 100, you know, like that. So it's, it, and our church is, is really highlighted in this, it's a beautiful film. I think Ed is maybe 10 minutes, 12 minutes maybe? How long is that film, about 12 minutes? Yeah, yeah, I think it's no one. yeah, yeah. He gets a chance, he gets a chance to talk about the Lord, and they show videos of the war, and you know it's it's beautiful. So professionally done. So, uh, uh, but anyway, I will send it out so everybody get a chance to see it. Let's pray, Heavenly Father, Lord. Thank you so much for our time today. I uh, uh, appreciate all of those who are here as we focus on the re the fruits of repentance, Lord. Uh, be with uh, the, our church. I pray, Lord, that something will be said this morning in church that someone will come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We pray for it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.